The human brain is not designed for speed. Yet we think nothing of hurling our brains through space at 40, 50, 60 miles an hour. And every few minutes here in the U.S., a speeding brain comes to an abrupt halt. Somewhere below, on the highways of South Florida, it has happened again. The air rescue team knows only that someone has been flung from a car in an accident. But experience has taught them about the nightmare of a decelerating head. On the ground and in the helicopter, they can count on their skills and technology to take over for broken flesh and bone, lost blood, still hearts and lungs. But the brain is on its own, crossing the frontier of modern medical knowledge and journeying alone into a dark continent called coma. The definition of coma is deceptively simple. It is a period of unconsciousness lasting more than an hour in which the patient's eyes are closed. It can result from a hundred different things, a drug overdose, a drowning, a heart attack, a stroke, a gunshot wound, or a terrible blow to the head. At any given time, some 10 to 15,000 Americans hover between life and death in a coma. Perhaps an equal number reside in an eerie post-coma state where their eyes have opened, but consciousness or awareness has not returned. In Greek, coma means sleep, but its surface resemblance to deep slumber hides a terrifying and little understood medical reality. Doctors in general are afraid of coma because we don't know how it acts, we don't know how to treat it. What we know is that right now, we really can't do much to make it better. As space age technology sheds light on the mysteries of the healthy brain, the brain in coma has kept its secrets. I think it's fair to say that the last 10 to 20 years of medicine has been the dark ages of coma. We, we knew so little, we didn't know how to classify it, so we never had to face it before because we never had this dilemma. The dilemma, our ability to defy death, has created the prospect of life without awareness, a life that many of us cannot help but doubt is worth living. Beginning in the 1960s and 70s, with the miracle of CPR, or cardiopulmonary resuscitation, we developed enormously powerful life-saving techniques and emergency response procedures without finding equivalent brain-saving ones. The result, a silent epidemic of unconsciousness. The main culprit, what physicians call deceleration injury. At a speed of just 35 miles per hour, a head can decelerate to zero in a split second. The results can be catastrophic. On impact, the brain ricochets within the skull, damaging the part of the brain closest to the point of impact and the part farthest away. Like all injured tissue, it begins to swell, a disastrous response for an organ confined by bone. Within the brain, Billions of tiny calamities play out in that instant. Brain cells, or neurons, have thin tentacles that reach out toward each other. In a violent impact, these tentacles stretch and sometimes snap, spewing chemicals that they normally emit in small, regulated bursts. This chemical brainstorm only adds to the swelling. Pressure mounts within the skull, squeezing off the blood supply to the outermost layers of the brain the thinking, feeling part of us, called the cerebral cortex. If the pressure rises enough, it will also begin to squeeze off the blood supply to the brain stem, the primitive core that controls our most basic life impulses, breathing, heart rate, temperature. And wherever swelling squeezes off blood supply, the brain begins to die, 
starved of fuel and oxygen. How much of the brain dies will dictate the coma's outcome. Unchecked swelling will kill both cortex and brainstem, resulting in brain death. Lesser swelling may destroy only the cortex and spare the brain stem, and the coma may evolve into indefinite unconsciousness. Swelling that subsides quickly enough will spare both parts of the brain, and the patient may regain consciousness. Blood pressure was 98 over 68. At Jackson Memorial Hospital in Miami, the radio crackles with news that the third traffic accident victim of the day is in the air and headed their way. The resuscitation team heads for the helipad on the roof, monitoring the air rescue team's continuous reports of the patient's vital signs. Along with the more familiar vitals of pulse, blood pressure, and respirations, they report a Glasgow Coma Score, or GCS. The GCS gives a rough idea of how much the swelling may be interfering with brain function and is based on how well the patient responds by speaking, moving, or eye opening. A GCS-3 is a profound coma. Nine marks the border between consciousness and unconsciousness. And this patient's GCS is a six. Time is of the essence in a head injury, and the team aims to get each patient down to the resuscitation unit in less than a minute. A GCS of just six means her eyes will not open, and she is silent. Most ominously, her responses to pain are delayed and weak. To get a better idea of just what has gone wrong in her brain, the team takes her in for a CT, or CAT scan, a series of x-rays taken to create a three-dimensional view of the brain. The battered brain belongs to Nelsi Figueroa, a 34-year-old mother of two, just arrived from Honduras to visit a friend. No sooner had she left the airport when a collision ejected her from the car she was in. Neurosurgeon Philip Villanueva and neurosurgical resident Michael Wolf confer over Nelsie's CT scans. Usually, they can do nothing surgically for a coma patient except drill a hole in the skull and place a monitor in the brain to measure pressure and swelling. The brain is sort of a stupid organ for all of the wonderful things that man has used his brain to create that brain simply doesn't know how to do anything other than swell after it's been injured. But the CT scans indicate that there is something the surgeons can do, they must do for Nelsie. The swelling in her brain from the impact and the chemical storm is being aggravated by a wild card, a blood clot. They shave and scrub her skull, choosing a line of approach to the clot that will damage the smallest amount of vital brain tissue. Once the scalp is peeled back, they will begin the surprisingly crude business of drilling holes in the skull, connecting the dots with a saw, and lifting out a chunk of bone to make way for their inroads to the blood clot. There are some very sophisticated things that are done in neurosurgery, but when it comes to at least neurotrauma, most of the time you're going to be limited to opening the head with a variety of different drills, taking out a blood clot, and trying to get the pieces put back together again. This doesn't vary extremely much from what the Incas and the Egyptians did you know, three and 5,000 years ago. As the doctors lift the crown of Nelsie's skull and expose her swelling brain, her family in Honduras waits and prays. Nelsie's sister Alma, a physician herself, understands the gravity of the situation. We had already spoken to the doctor, and he explained more or less what it was she had, and that the type of lesion to the brain was very large. 
When I was speaking with him, she had just been rolled out from surgery, and he said that her chances of survival were minimal. But if she could make it through the night, her probabilities of surviving would increase. After several grueling hours of surgery, the clot has been removed from Nelsie's brain, but her condition is still critical. She's been moved to the Neurosurgical Intensive Care Unit, a community of the unconscious and those slowly regaining consciousness. Some here have been in coma for weeks. In the ICU, technology seems fused to the flesh taking over every conceivable vital function that the injured brain has abandoned. Machines shove oxygen into lungs and suck out carbon dioxide. The beds tilt, keeping blood from pooling throughout the body and liquid from collecting in the lungs. Probes inserted through holes in skulls monitor all important brain pressure. No matter what the cause, the longer a coma goes on, the worse the outlook. And doctors, as yet, have no way of predicting who will wake up, when. Families who have loved ones uh, in the unit uh, with a coma expect that one day they're going to come in and visit and all of a sudden they're going to be wide awake and alert and say hello and uh, recognize them and know who they are, but that's simply not the case. Not long ago, physicians thought that the experience of coma was as blank on the inside as it looks to us on the outside. But many people have come back from the brink to report an unexpectedly rich interior life. I mean, there's no concept of time in coma. You have no edges on your days. There's no day, there's no night, there's nothing in between. What I did become conscious of is that Periodically, I was aware of the fact that I was thinking, but I had no attachment whatsoever to a body. I couldn't feel my legs, my arms, my face. I couldn't feel anything. And I remember becoming aware of the fact that I might be dead, but I was still thinking. How could I still be thinking? Journalist Mary Kay Blakely spent nine days in a diabetic coma. While unconscious, her brain was still clearly incorporating bits of hospital reality into bizarre and frightening hallucinations. At one time, I remember thinking that I was in a prison because I was gagged. Of course, there was a respirator in my mouth. Um, I was handcuffed. I had apparently been so active during this coma that restraints were used to make sure I wouldn't dislodge the tubes. and. Every once in a while, the guards would come in to torture me. I was injected, and they poked me with needles. There is a fairly good body of literature that patients do have some memories. Uh, they may not be able to reconstruct it, but they still have some emotional response to the surrounding stimuli and as the saying goes, hearing is the last sensation lost. So his pupils are, are reacting to light. When coma begins to lift, so does the anguish of loved ones. But for the patient, it's often the opposite, as unwelcome sensations come flooding back. My very first recollection of waking up is of three shadowy figures leaning over me, shouting my name as if I were in a tunnel and they were at a very great distance. And I remember being annoyed. I just wanted to sleep. I wanted to get back. And I was starting to feel those physical sensations of pain um, as I was getting reattached to my body again. This person was shouting my name and saying, Mary Kay, can you tell me how many fingers I'm holding up? And I remember thinking, who are these jerks and why can't they count to three? Nelsie, abre los ojos. Just a day after her brain surgery, Nelsie is stirring. Removing the blood clot has stopped the vicious cycle of brain swelling better than the surgeons had dared hope. Dr. Wolf heralds her awakening with a new Glasgow coma score.
Her ability to follow commands brings her up to an 11 out of 15 on the scale. Her coma has ended. The physicians predict a good outcome, her brain damage minimal enough that with time, only her family and closest friends will notice her occasional lapse of memory or coordination. On her third day in the hospital, Nelsie faces another hurdle. They prepare to remove the equipment that has been breathing for her. You're doing good, Nelsie. You're doing good. Okay, on the count of three. One, two, three. Very good. Her brain stem, stunned in the accident, is now back online and resumes control of breathing. That's good, Nelsie. Breathe through your mouth. An even more hopeful sign, Nelsie breathes her first word. She still has a long road ahead of her, even after a day-long coma. On day four, Nelsie graduates from the neurosurgical ICU to the neurology ward, where her sisters and friends fuss over her with a mixture of worry and relief. For Alma, the doctor in the family, Nelsie's response is a vital medical lesson. Her change from one day to the next, that is, when we arrived and she saw us, and she realized that we were her sisters, the change was huge. I was scared because the change was so monumental. And the impact that the family has in these instances is so very important. Nelsie's new home on the neurology floor brings her into the domain of Dr. Kester Ned. Under his care are several other less fortunate patients, people whose comas have dragged on for weeks and have begun to evolve into something more ominous. Prolonged coma remains one of the most humbling and mystifying medical phenomena known. Two months after a car accident, 19-year-old Juan Ocasio remains unconscious. But in strictly technical terms, his coma has ended. After a month, almost all patients can be physiologically awakened, if not mentally. This is because the rugged brain stem has recovered enough to resume control of the so-called vegetative functions, sleep-wake cycles, breathing, heart rate, and temperature. But if the delicate higher centers of the brain haven't recovered, the brain stem's message to awaken will go unheard, and the patient will remain utterly unconscious despite the open eyes. There's a lot of um, misconceptions about the word coma and the terms associated with coma. And one of those terms we hear commonly use, uh, you're a vegetable, or the person is in a vegetative state. This is not only confusing to patients, but it's confusing to doctors. Vegetative means that the sleep-like part of the coma has ended. It does not imply that Juan is a vegetable. All right, I'm coming up. Not only is he breathing and opening his eyes on his own, he blinks, coughs, moans, sighs, yawns, and grimaces. His mother knows not to interpret these as consciousness yet. So they, they, they see, you know, they see responses from him, but not to say, well, he's waking up next week. There's nothing there. Juan, you want to open your eyes? When I muffle his head like this, I play with it, see he'll open his eyes. Easy, take it easy. Mementos of Juan's high school years stand in stark contrast to his current state. Knowing that hearing will be the first sense to return if he starts waking up, Nevea reminds him of his past and updates him on the present. 
Oh, well, I let him know the date, you know, what's going on with life with his sisters, his brother, because he's got a newborn brother that he asked me for so long. That's what I nag him most about. I said, you wanted your brother, now I gave him to you, and I look at you sleeping. And I just let him know that he loves life so much he needs to wake up and continue living. Uh, Doctors used to think of the vegetative state as the death of hope, a sign that consciousness would never return. Now they know that it can be a stepping stone to recovery. And Dr. Ned's exam uncovers reason for optimism. Slowly, Juan's reactions are becoming more sophisticated, indicating that higher levels of the brain may be coming back online. And once you start seeing those, they suggest that there are some complex uh, cerebral processes going on in the cortex that's uh, showing that he will potentially wake up. The term vegetative was coined just 25 years ago as physicians began to identify what their life-saving technology had inadvertently created. Patients who were not brain dead, who could breathe on their own and open their eyes, but who were still unconscious. In 1976, Karen Ann Quinlan graphically demonstrated the phenomenon when, at her parents' request, the courts allowed the machinery that breathed for her to be removed. But she continued to breathe on her own, living for another nine years without regaining consciousness. Quinlan became an icon of a new medical dilemma. Where do we draw the line between life with dignity and undignified existence? In the ensuing years, the ethical picture has only gotten more complex as the medical line between consciousness and unconsciousness has become more elusive. To the concepts of coma, brain death, and vegetative state, experts have added a gray zone where patients seem to be slightly conscious at some times and unreachable at others. This is the minimally conscious state. The spectrum of consciousness from there can range upwards to rare patients who are actually quite aware but appear vegetative, so paralyzed that they can move only their eyes, a terrifying state known as locked in. Neuropsychologist Joseph Giacino of the JFK Johnson Rehabilitation Center in Edison, New Jersey, is a leading authority on coma and the related disorders of consciousness. How did that happen? His job requires him to try to quantify the unquantifiable, assessing head injured patients to determine for families, insurers, and sometimes the courts, just how much of the person may be left in there. Who's the president? Tell me who the president of the United States The state States of now. coma science gives him shockingly few tools to work with. I would say our understanding of coma is poor. Uh, we know its behavioral Steve? characteristics, Steve, but uh, we don't know why it presents the way it does. We don't know um, how it changes. We don't know when it will change. Um, so we have very little understanding of what coma is and, frankly, what the vegetative state is and most of these uh, disorders of consciousness. Uh, we're, you know, uh, we're still in the dark ages for the most part. A lack of consciousness is readily determined only in extreme cases like Paul's. Seven years ago, Paul went into the hospital for minor surgery on his ear. While under anesthesia, his heart stopped beating, and the higher levels of his brain suffocated from lack of oxygen, or anoxia, the most devastating injury to the brain. He is clearly vegetative. And now your leg, Paul. In patients like Paul, brain scans can help confirm that the patient will never regain consciousness, showing how the higher centers of the brain have atrophied or shrunk. Paul, look at me. I'm over here. I'm on your right. Look right at me. In most cases, ruling out awareness is a much trickier task. Well, what color are my eyes? Tell me the what color first eyes. problem that we have to face is that awareness is inferred. There is no way to gain direct evidence of awareness. So what we do is we look at behavior. So behavioral evidence is uh, the only evidence, essentially, or the strongest evidence uh, for the presence or the absence of awareness. Keith, close your eyes. 
Close your eyes. Close them right now, so I know you're understanding me. This is Keith. His distressing condition illustrates the terrible conundrum of trying to judge the brain based solely on what the body is capable of. Sometimes he seems to show a glimmer of understanding of his condition and reacts with what looks like frustration. Just relax. Okay. But crying is a primitive response, not necessarily an indication of consciousness. Can you see me? Still, his distress seems to occur more often when he is asked to perform a task than when he is left alone. Keith, I want to know how much you're understanding me. It's not enough to say that this is clear evidence of consciousness, um, but it, you're also left with an uncomfortable feeling about saying this is clearly the vegetative state. All right, listen really carefully. Listen very carefully to me. You're doing fine. The so. difficulty here is for his family. So when his mother sees relax. these responses, relax. the crying, etc., it's very hard for her, even though she on an intellectual level knows that it's possible that these things can happen reflexively. Well, seven years after the accident, he's what they call vegetative. But he uh, cries. He moans if he's not feeling well. He lets you know if he's not comfortable. He gets very aggravated. He sneezes and he coughs and he does, I've seen him do just about everything you and I do other than smile. I haven't seen him smile for seven years. For brief seconds I have thought for his sake it probably would have been better if he had died in the accident. But Keith did not die in the accident and he has clung fiercely to life through many crises during these past seven years. For Keith, there can be no hope for improvement after so long. Hope is reserved for those who have been unconscious for less than a year. When Marlena came to the JFK Johnson Center a few weeks after a car accident, she was vegetative but restless, giving Dr. Giacino hope that she might soon emerge. I want you to lift your arm up, lift your arm up, move your arm, do it right now. It's very important, do it right now. But the weeks turned to months, and that hope started to diminish. That's important now. Now we know that her recovery. Well, then I'm going to just turn you around a little bit here. Then, almost six months after the accident, Marlena woke up. How are you doing? My name's uh, Dr. Giacino. Show me how you use this. Her do? progress was slow at first, but still remarkable given the length of her coma. What do you do with that thing? She grappled with the strange requests of her examiners, baffled by some, and slowly mastering others. Bang. In the course of therapy, it became apparent that Marlena's speech was impaired, but her ability to read had the experts shaking their heads in amazement. Her prognosis in the beginning was not good at all, and to see how she's recovered and how she continues to recover is just amazing. I mean, I didn't think she'd ever be able to hug me, let alone, you know, say mom. I mean, she didn't recognize me for a long time. What do you call this thing? Uh, Bob. Excellent. Today, almost two years after the accident, Marlene is back for another assessment. Good. Her recovery Good continues to amaze, okay, a... but her progress uh, remains a fascinating oh, study one. in the idiosyncrasies of the brain mm, after coma. Can I, let me ask you some things about when you were here. Do you remember this place? Why were you here? Do you no matter how many times she is told of the accident and the coma, she seems to forget right. them completely a few right. minutes later. And did you know that you were in a coma for part of that time? No. You didn't know that. Head injuries often damage the control mechanisms that police our actions and emotions. And in Marlena's case, her words. That, that's pretty amazing, huh? Yeah. 
nasty. She is strikingly unaware of the impact the injury has had on her. This is particularly difficult for treating individuals who have severe brain injury because they don't know the problem exists. So we have to begin this whole process by educating them that they're not the same. Do you have any other problems now that you didn't have before? Just my memory. Okay. How about um, your walking? Physic your physical ability. How about your walking? How is it? No. Any problems? Not at all. So let me ask you a question. You're in a wheelchair today. Why the fuck we're in this chair? Well, that was my question. Why are you in a wheelchair? Do you know why? No. Mm -hmm. Did I have an accident? Yeah. Really? Yes. <laughs> In the early 1990s, a national task force convened to try and make sense of the mysteries of the vegetative state. Their review of coma statistics confirmed that consciousness may return to brain trauma patients like Marlena before a year is up, in the case of oxygen deprivation that falls to just three months. But once those windows of hope have closed, the chances of a good outcome approach zero. Thus, for every Marlena, there are others who linger in the netherworld of unconsciousness, leaving their families to wrestle with appalling decisions. They are families like the Cruzans, who, after their daughter spent three years in a vegetative state, began a legal battle to have her feeding tube removed. In 1990, the Supreme Court agreed that Nancy Cruzan would not have wanted to live in a vegetative state. Neurologist Ronald Cranford provided expert testimony in the case. This state of the vegetative state is worse than death. It's a living death. Because with death, you can move on with your life. You grief, you suffer, you've got no choice. You move on. With the vegetative state, you don't move on. They're alive, but they're not alive. They're there. They're the loved one you saw, but they're not interacting with you. So it's, it's a far worse state than being dead. For two decades, Cranford has been on the cutting edge of the ethical dilemmas created by medical technology, testifying in many landmark cases like the Cruzans. He also co-chaired the task force that marked out the boundaries of hope for vegetative patients. Cranford's experience and the results of the task force's exhaustive research have made him a harsh critic of those who claim to treat coma and vegetative state. So you're talking about a situation where there's desperation. Desperation on the part of the family, they don't believe anything. And there's people out there to feed into it. And unfortunately, I think a lot of these treatments for the vegetative state and treatment for severe brain damage fall in that category. When physicians like Cranford are loath to offer false hope in the absence of proof that any treatment works, families of coma patients often embark on pilgrimages to a handful of unproven shrines of hope. Many of the most desperate end up here at the Ocean Hyperbaric Center in Lauderdale-by-the-Sea, Florida. As long as the doctor says nothing can be done, nothing will ever get done. This is where we take off. We get the dregs of civilization here. We get the ones in which nothing can be done. It's not true. As long as we think that way, nothing will ever be done. Dr. Richard Neubauer uses these chambers to treat a host of diseases and injuries, including, controversially, coma and vegetative state. They are hyperbaric oxygen chambers, originally designed to treat divers who get decompression sickness, or what most of us know as the bends. In an atmosphere of pure oxygen, the person inside takes an artificial dive to a depth of 20 or 30 feet, where the pressure is about one and a half to two times greater than normal. According to Neubauer, the high-pressure oxygen reaches the brain and awakens tissue that has been stunned but not killed by whatever caused the coma in the first place. Hello, Ian. Now, the role of hyperbaric oxygen is not miraculous. The role of hyperbaric oxygen is to expedite the 
revivification, the refiring of these areas that are dormant. That is, they're stunned. They're like sleeping cells. But the dormant cells theory doesn't hold much water with the medical establishment. The idea of idling dormant neurons that come alive has been around for 50 to 100 years. It's never been shown to be true. It might be someday. We might be all proven wrong. But that's a concept that has appeal to the lay public. And it sounds so neat. And with HBO studies, there's no evidence that this really works. Neubauer points to before and after brain scan, showing what he believes to be proof that hyperbaric oxygen, or HBO, is lighting up areas of stunned brain tissue in coma patients. But there's a catch. The brain may well simply be healing on its own, and other HBO centers have failed to confirm Neubauer's results. When you're talking about hyperbaric oxygen chamber studies, if this was good studies, it would be reproducible by other centers. That's just a fact of American medicine. Nobody's that far out, that good, that they can only produce it. And this stuff will never be reproducible. With no controlled studies showing that hyperbaric oxygen works on coma or vegetative state, most of the medical community spurns Dr. Neubauer's use of it. But parents like the Cifuentes don't care what can and cannot be proven. A year ago, Three-year-old Eric hit his head and tumbled into a pool, starving his brain of oxygen and plunging him into a coma. Three months after the accident, we had heard from a nun who sent us a clipping about the hyperbaric chamber. It's made a difference in his it's life as well as life ours. Back. He's yeah, a it child. gave us our son back. <laughs> All the doctors did. told us he would be a vegetable. He will not do a thing. Yeah, he was, I mean, couldn't, couldn't even not. express pain. <laughs> And look at him now, using both of his hands, he's, you know, sitting, able to hold his head up, everything. I mean, it's, it's a miracle. All right, all right, we're all done. Eric might have pulled off this miracle on his own as he woke up in about three months, just within the window of hope for his age and injury. Thus, the Cifuentes may have spent tens of thousands of dollars on unnecessary HBO treatments. You know, in medicine, well, we like money, but, but we like honors, too. And if Neubauer had something, he'd be going for a Nobel Prize. He wouldn't be going for $150 a crack or 120 treatments. He'd be Nobel prizing it. No matter where the roots of Eric's awakening lie, his chances of developing normally are good, thanks to the resilience and flexibility of a child's brain. But scientists are divided as to how flexible the brain remains after the first few years of life. Research has proven there's a certain amount of redundancy in the way brain cells handle any given task. But can the damaged brain be taught to rewire itself using its own spare parts? With coma, at least, the question remains unanswered. Still, many brain injury specialists have pinned their hopes on those spare brain cells, attempting to retrain them through gentle stimulation. But the aggressive approach to stimulation advocated by neurosurgeon Mihai Dimanchescu has raised eyebrows among the medical establishment while making believers of many who were told to give up hope. Kelly Dolan was heading to a soccer game when the car she was in struck a tree 16 months ago. She was just 15. She's awake now, but it's difficult to tell how aware she is. Little things that we were hoping to see, movement, smiles, hand squeezes, none of that started to occur till we got home and started doing this program with Dr. DiMancesco. Um, uh, um, uh, um, there you go, that's it. Um, uh, okay. Okay, Dr. Dimanchescu's treatment consists of intensive Ooh. stimulation of the senses of the coma victim for 12 hours every day. A barrage of lights, sounds, smells, tastes, touches, and movements designed, in theory, to get undamaged parts of the brain to take over for the damaged ones. This little brush on your forehead, down the side of your cheek, the side of your neck. The normal healthy individual probably never uses more than 10% of the brain's potential. That means 90% of the brain is untapped. 
But when the brain's been hurt, we suddenly lose a million brain cells or two million brain cells, but there's still several billion there. And all we have to do is try to find a way to reconnect them, to get them working again. And that's done through the stimulation, through the constant exposure, uh, just the way we expose our children when we're trying to get them to develop. The Freeport community on Long Island rallied around Kelly and the Dolans. More than 100 volunteers now lend a hand in the intense stimulation routine, allowing Kelly's parents and four brothers to preserve a treasured semblance of normal family life. Let's go one more time. Telephone. She's made more progress in three months at home than she'd made for a year in rehabilitation facilities, which is another indication to me of the importance of the family. And even though it's very difficult to ask a family to get involved, to the degree that I like to see them involved. And it's not every family that can provide that kind of involvement. When it can be provided, it's wonderful. So this system isn't necessarily made for patients to be lifted, but it's for car motors. And although Kelly doesn't weigh as much as a car motor, it does a wonderful job and made life easier for Nancy and I. A friend of the family designed and built a room specifically to make caring for Kelly easier, using material donated by local businesses. Dimanchescu claims that more than 90% of his patients, all previously written off by other doctors as hopeless, have regained consciousness. A third of them recovered well enough to function independently. These success rates are so high as to invite skepticism from the medical community. This concept of providing external sensory stimulation to promote recovery from coma, to facilitate arousal, um, has been around now for probably 15 years or, or maybe even more. Um, but again, there, there is to date certainly no convincing evidence that it's effective. One, two, three. Families and doctors sometimes disagree not only about whether a particular treatment is helping a patient, Frequently, they disagree whether the patient is conscious at all. At 16, Jason Silver was struck by a car as he walked to school. That was 10 years ago. Some of the doctors who have examined him say he is still completely unconscious. Most of the doctors just say Jason is still a veggie or a vegetable. He does not understand anything. Any movement he makes is uh, involuntary. involuntary. Uh, there's no question in my mind that he is aware that he knows what's going on. Got it. In therapy, Jason's movements, whether voluntary or involuntary, operate a switch to mimic the roll of the dice. Excellent. All right. That's the way. One, two, three, four, five. All right. Meanwhile, Jason's parents continue to search and hope. Recently, they've brought in an energy healer to work with their son. We would try anything. I mean, we'll sell the house if we have to, if somebody says something that might be able to help, even though it's not being tried. If I try it and it doesn't work, well, then it didn't work. But how do we know unless we try it? The healthy brain is hard enough to study, Multiply its complexities by the number of things that cause coma, and designing a perfect study of coma treatments becomes almost impossible. The ironic result, all coma treatments are as difficult to disprove as prove. Physicians are left to decide which is less cruel, infinitesimal hope, false hope, or no hope at all. There's not really any good shred of evidence to support the position that patients who have brain damage get better with any specific treatment. You know, we've we passed through a lot, in the last 20, 30 years, we've passed through a lot of miracle cures. And when you look back at the history of medicine and track this out, there's always these miracle recoveries that don't work. But all of us have seen coma miracle headlines at one time or another. What are those cases? The task force that Dr. Cranford co-chaired pursued every reported case of patients returning to consciousness after a year. They were able to verify only five, and each of those patients 
remained profoundly brain damaged. The task force could find no miracles. The closest thing Cranford says he has seen is the Gary Dockery case, the so-called coma cop. In February of 1996, news reports swept the nation that a police officer, shot in the head some seven years earlier, had emerged from a coma and begun speaking to his family, recognizing his now teenage sons. Shane and Colt Dockery say it's a dream come true to have their father, Gary Dockery, awake from a coma after seven and a half years. Well, at seven o'clock that morning, he started talking, so his, you know, that, was, that gave us a... We had hope, but that gave us 10 million times more hope for him and hoping that he would come out of it and be able to come home with us someday. Dockery's hospital was inundated with phone calls from families of comatose and vegetative people wanting desperately to know how they had awakened the coma cop. There's something about Dockery where he made a very dramatic recovery, a period of three, four hours, which I think was credible, was real. There's one area where there's something there we don't know. And I can't explain it, and I don't want to call it a miracle, but Dockery rapidly responded and came around. And it was really very as dramatic as it sounded. But there was a catch. Gary Dockery was not in a coma or a vegetative state. Instead, he had lingered in the minimally conscious netherworld, at times able to communicate through blinks and nods, at others unreachable. And cruelly, Within a week of startling his family with his ability to carry on a conversation, Dockery began to say less and less. Eventually, he fell silent again. A year later, on April 15, 1997, he died, leaving the experts with one more mystery and the families of coma patients with one less potential miracle. But the major impact on this was it reinforced the notion that People can wake up from a coma and be fine. And this can happen in, you know, in, in minutes. So you can be comatose one minute and talking on the phone the next minute. This is not the case. People don't wake up and are, and, 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 and are OK. Whether it lasts a day or a decade, coma changes lives forever. Nelsie continued her swift recovery after the surgeons removed the blood clot from her brain and was able to return to Honduras just three weeks later. Despite some weakness on one side and some memory problems, she hopes to return to work soon. She remembers nothing of the hospital in Miami, with one remarkable exception. The only thing I remember is the picture of Jesus and I remember I saw him, and he told me I had been operated on, and that I was going to wake up, and he'd give me back my two children. Meanwhile, the families of the unawakened and the slowly awakening are left to maintain their vigils of hope. Another month has passed, and 19-year-old Juan has come home without regaining consciousness. Well, he has a lot of more vocal sounds. He's doing a lot of more moaning, complaining. He makes more sounds. He follows with the eyes. He looks. Normally, he keeps one eye open a lot when he's awake. When he really wants to make me happy, he'll have both eyes open. You remember that? Tell me if you do. You do. OK. So. His siblings join the attempt to wake him enlisting even the four-month-old brother that he begged his mother to have. Kelly is now 17. Attempts to get her to communicate with Blinks are getting mixed results. You know, we don't know what the future holds for us, but all the doors are still open, and that whatever we can do to make those doors swing in the right direction, we're going to do. The wonderful thing about the brain, we really don't know until she can't do something down the road what she's going to be able to do, what she's not going to be able to do.
Seven years after his accident, Keith's mom still visits every day. I can't give him more than comfort. I can't give him more than that. The only one who can give him more than that is God. A miracle is the only thing that's coming for him to, ch to change him. They can open a, a human being up and take out body parts and transplant them into another human being successfully. They can, they can reattach limbs. We have men, men um, going to Mars. Why can't we find some healing medication for the, for the brain cells? I don't say brain surgery, but medication. The goal is always a cure. With coma and the related disorders of consciousness, we're not even sure how to improve the condition, um, let alone cure it. I think with respect to whether we're going to find a cure or a treatment for coma, or the vegetative state the next few years. I don't think we're gonna do that in my lifetime. In 1996, Congress passed a law mandating more funding for research into brain injury. But the fruits of that research are almost certainly years, if not decades off. And in emergency rooms and operating theaters around the country, medical wizardry continues to defy death and death makes inroads into life itself, eroding our definitions of both. On the dark continent of coma, only one thing seems sure, until brain-saving techniques start to catch up with life-saving ones. The silent epidemic will only get worse. Thank you.